Good morning to our audience in LA, Vancouver, Greece, and the world over. My name is Dimitris Kralis, and I'm professor of Byzantine history at Simon Fraser University's Department of Humanities and director of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies, our institution. The sister program to UCLA's SNF Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture, which is presided by my wonderful colleague and fellow Byzantinist, Professor Sharon Gestel. It is the generosity of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation that over the years made this and many other of our events possible. This event in particular is the second in a series of events that are part of a long-term collaboration with, uh, between our two centers that aims to more efficiently harness our combined resources for the benefit of our students and the communities we serve in LA, Vancouver, and the world over. On this 200th anniversary since the beginning of the Greek War of Independence, as we celebrate that seminal moment when we can, in a way, date the beginning of the Age of Nations, it is more than appropriate that two Hellenic studies centers far from Greece, nestled within vibrant communities of diaspora Greeks, are carrying the torch down the path of memory. For it was among diaspora Greeks that 200 years ago, the planning and organization for what was to become a Greek event took place, reminding us that whatever the distances involved, Hellenism has since antiquity been a distributed phenomenon anchored to be sure in Greece, but strengthened by and constantly renewed through its relationships with its far-flung diasporic branches. In order to emphasize this vital link between the diaspora and metropolitan Greece, my colleagues at UCLA and our team in Vancouver sought from the first moment to engage Greece's diplomatic representatives in our respective countries, the US and Canada. This event is therefore organized under the auspices of the Greek embassies in the US and Canada and has benefited from the support of our consular authorities in LA and Vancouver as well. I would therefore like to thank and acknowledge their excellencies, Ambassador Alexandra Papadopoulou, the Consul General of Greece in LA, Evgenia Benyatoglu, and the Consul General of Greece in Vancouver, Eleni Georgopoulou, before I introduce you to the Ambassador of Greece to Canada, Her Excellency, Konstantina Athanasiadou. Ambassador Athanasiadou, holds a degree in philosophy, classical studies, linguistics, and French literature from the Faculty of Philosophy to the University of Athens, and a degree in medieval and modern Greek studies and history from the Faculty of Philosophy at Ioannina University. She has had a storied career at the Foreign Ministry, a career which has taken her from Moscow to London and Alexandria, and from the offices of the EU in Brussels to the WTO in Geneva and the United Nations in New York. She has also held key posts at the Foreign Ministry, including that of Chief of Protocol and Head of the Deputy Foreign Minister Diplomatic Cabinet. She has been serving in Canada since the fall of two, uh, 2020. Ambassador uh, uh, Athanasiadou is a Grand Commander of the Order of the Phoenix of the Hellenic Republic and is particularly honored to also bear the St. Mark Cross of the Patriarchate of Alexandria and over of Africa. She speaks English, French, Spanish, and Russian. So without further ado, Ambassador, to you. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it was uh, your uh, presentation was amazing. Uh, I, I would like to congratulate the center, actually uh, both centers for uh, presenting today's event. Uh, and um, you know that the Embassy of Greece will be always supportive uh, to such event. And I hope that we will have a, a good cooperation in the future as well. Um, the, the chapter uh, concerning uh, fighters and women, uh, fighters and victims, uh, women's lives during the Greek Revolution, uh, which is uh, very important uh, since we are celebrating the 200 years of independence, is a chapter which for me had, uh, um, I do not have an in-depth uh, knowledge um, of this. So I will uh, really uh, be interested today uh, to uh, follow the presentation by such a renowned uh, uh, professor, uh, Dr. Tsugarakis, and perhaps I will avail myself of small comments uh, or a question at the end. Um, I wanted to tell you that uh, I have a high esteem for the, the program of the center and also the center um, of uh, um, uh, the United States. And uh, that um, I am really good, um, looking forward uh, this year to present more events uh, 
under the umbrella of the 200 years of independence. Uh, perhaps on other uh, topics, uh, um, on the background uh, of um, uh, the revolution, meaning, for instance, um, the diplomatic background, historic events, uh, um, the outcomes uh, in the different um, uh, levels uh, of the progress of the revolution until the creation of the modern Greek state. So uh, without taking more time, I wish you all the best. I'm sure it will be a very successful event. I'm very happy to have met you, all of you, uh, at this stage. And uh, I'm really looking forward to meeting you in person in the very near future. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Ambassador, thank you very much for your support and your kind words and I can uh, assure you that we will find occasion to uh, have you in Vancouver, host you uh, and share our experiences and hopefully if we uh, time it well uh, we might also have Sharon over for uh, the November event we're planning on which there will be more information. Uh, so with, um, with that in mind we're moving on and it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague uh, at uh, UCLA, Dr. Simos Zenios, Associate Director of UCLA Stavros Niafos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture, uh, who will moderate our, our discussion and introduce our speaker today. Simos received his PhD in Comparative Literature at Harvard University and since 2018 has taught Greek language and literature at UCLA. His research focuses on the relationship between aesthetics and political power in the European long 19th uh, century with emphasis on the literature of the Greek Revolution. His publications cover a broad range of topics and figures, European Philhellenism, Enlightenment theories of rhetoric, and the Amadios Korais, Dionysus Solomos, and Greek modernism. So, welcome, Sino, to you. Kind words, uh, for the kind words, and I'm thrilled to welcome everyone as well. Before I introduce our speaker, a few housekeeping details. As you already know, the meeting is being recorded, and I would like to ask you to keep your microphones muted for the duration of the talk. You will have the opportunity to pose questions uh, once, the, uh, once the lecture is finished, either by using the, uh, the raise hand icon, which is under reactions at the bottom of your screen, or you can simply type your question in the chat and I will pass it on to the speaker. Now, on to the event that brings us here. It is with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce to you today, Eleni Angelomati Tsungaragis, Professor Emerita at the Ionian University. Eleni studied history and archaeology at the University of Athens, and she holds a PhD in modern history from the University of Oxford. She was a research director at the Research Center for Medieval and Modern Greek Studies of the Academy of Athens. Following that, she held the position of Professor of History at the Ionian University for 15 years. Her interests cover a wide range of subjects, social history, history of intellectual life and, edu and education, church history, landscape history, and travel literature as a source for historical knowledge. Before I present her own contributions to scholarship, I want to highlight her impact in collaborative projects. As a director of the MA program, Methodology on Criticism and Editing Historical Sources, at the Ionian University. She oversaw the editing of and the commentary on numerous historical sources from all periods of early modern Greek and modern Greek history. Several of these sources have been published by the Ionian University Press. Her own publications cover various topics of Greek history from the 15th to the 19th century. We will, need to, we will need a separate uh, meeting devoted to, to her work in order to do justice, both to the range and to the depth of it. Over 70 papers in academic journals and edited volumes, seven monographs, and a further seven edited volumes. I will highlight only two of her monographs, the Ionian Academy, the Chronicle of the Foundation of the, of the First Greek University, which has enriched our, our understanding of the intellectual life on the, of the Ionian Islands, and the eve of the Greek revival, British travelers' perceptions of early 19th century Greece, which is foundational in studies of Hellenism, and I can attest to that personally. 
her forthcoming book will examine the role of women in the Greek Revolution. We will have a chance today for a sneak preview from that war with the lecture, Fighters and Victims, Women's Lives During the Greek Revolution. Eleni, the floor is yours. Hello to everybody. I must thank firstly, your excellencies, the ambassador of Greece to the USA, Alexander Papadopoulou, the ambassador of Greece to Canada, Constantino Thanasiadou, the consul general of Greece in Los Angeles, Mrs. Evgenia Benyatoglu, and the consul general of Greece in Vancouver, Mrs. Ellen Georgopoulou. It is an honor and a privilege for me to be invited to speak in at this important occasion that celebrates the bicentenary of the Greek Revolution, which is under their aegis. I'm also particularly indebted to the two Stavros Niarchos Foundation centers at UCLA and at Simon Fraser University for the invitation and the organization of this event. Thank you all. Now, a very perhaps not tiresome for you, but uh, it is a really a very uh, brief uh, view you will have of uh, the, the role of the women, the Greek Revolution. Greek women's lives, sorry, I have to turn the share there. I don't know where my own view is. Anyway, Greek women's lives during the Greek Revolution are not very well documented. Official documents referring to the Greek Revolution are not very well documented. Official documents referring to them are comparatively few letters, memoirs, histories, offer us fragmentary, partial, and very often subjective and secondhand information. In the past, uh, can we see the slides? I don't know. We cannot. I've shared the screen. Can you see them now? I believe we can't. If you want to, okay. Oh, there. Well, thank you very much for your patience and my husband for helping me. As I told you, the documents on women's role in the revolution are few, and so their lives and deeds are not well documented. The revolution affected the Greeks of various places differently and for a different length of time. Women and children were equally affected, though in different ways and in varying degrees. Their lives, hard as they might have been previously, were usually overturned because destruction, loss of lives, enslavement, unbearable human suffering, and mass refugee movements prevailed. Greek women lived and functioned in the private sector. Married women of the higher ranks of society usually had a rather comfortable and sheltered life, supervising the running of their household and the raising of their children. But they were seldom seen in public, although occasionally they might have had some activity in economic affairs. It was only the widows who, as head of their families, were legally more liberated and thus much more active in all social and economic life. Young girls were totally secluded until marriage. Marriage was a social obligation for the family and for both sexes. Not getting married and having children was also considered detrimental to the Greeks for demographical reasons as an ecumenical patriarch had pronounced in the middle of the 18th century. Early betrothals were customary, so were marriages at very young age. The legal marriage age was 12 for the girls and 14 for the boys. Uh, 
Despite that, more men married much later in life, causing the disapproval of the aforementioned patriarch. Dowries were essential for marriages and the mar and families were obliged to provide them. Lower class women had very hard lives. In rural areas, they worked along with the other family members as unpaid laborers or as hired agricultural laborers since very young age. They took care of all household duties and of raising their Where children. The yes, uh, as uh, they took care of the household duties and of raising their children or their young siblings. In the towns, poor girls worked usually as servants, married women as wet nurses. On the islands and in mountainous areas, only women and elderly people carried out the agriculture and all other kinds of work, since most men were absent from their homes for long periods of time, working as sailors, carriers, traders, artisans, etc. Additionally, every stage of the production of clothing for the entire family was done by women. On some islands and in mountainous villages, there were also small or medium, medium scale private enterprises run by women, mostly in making cloth, stockings, gloves, and caps, handkerchiefs, and various other things such as sails and roads. Education for girls was non existent except for those who belonged to families of scholars or to the higher ranks of society, like the Fanariot ladies. Contrary to this rather dismal picture, Greek women had more legal rights than most European women. Not all the present day Greece was then under the Ottomans. On the other hand, a very large Greek population lived all over the Ottoman Empire outside of Greece. So the revolution directly or indirectly affected them as well. The Ionian Islands were then a British protectorate the Ionian state, and the Ionian Greeks were its citizens. As a great number of, of, of Ionian men left to join the revolution, and the Ionian merchant navy helped transporting men, food, and ammunition to the fighting Greece, Greeks, the British imposed a very strict, strict neutrality, stipulating severe punishment for offenders. Moreover, the Ionians were also affected by the influx of refugees from mainland Greece, whom they tried to help and support. The consequences of the war were very severe on all the Aegean islands. Some were totally destroyed. Cyprus and Crete suffered a great deal and many of their inhabitants migrated to Greece. Other islands suffered for various reasons and for, very, for very varying degrees from the expedition of the Ottoman navy the results of the, the battles in their vicinity, occasional pirate attacks, internal strifes between the Orthodox and Catholic communities, etc. Many of them faced a very serious refugee problem. People from Asia Minor, Crete, other Aegean islands, and mainland Greece sought shelter there. Often the refugees were much greater in number than the local population of some small islands, which could quietly support them, barren and poor as they were, and with their commerce seriously or completely disrupted. Only in few of the small but rich islands, everyday life continued without many dramatic changes. Since the revolution did not break out everywhere at the same time, the first changes in women's lives started being felt gradually. When the news of the revolution in the Danubian principalities, as you see them there, uh, became known, some of the distinguished Fanerot Greek families escaped from Constantinople to Russia just in time. For, uh, then some managed to get out of the Constantinople later, but when the Sultan's order and the executions of the most important Fanariot officials and the patriarchs started, while the mob indiscriminately killed the Greeks of the city, 
the Greek old, the Greek noble ladies were difficult to get shelter anywhere. Some of them managed to escape secretly on board Greek ships and the Russian flag helped by the Russian consul. Others were exiled along with their children to various towns of Asia Minor, while some others were kept imprisoned in their own houses. On the eve of the Greek revival of the Greek revolution in the Peloponnese, and immediately after, many local political readers, chieftains, and some merchants moved their families to safer places like the fortified monastery of Megaspilion in Calabrita and the castle of Tromuchi in Western Peloponnese. Then all of these and many others were transferred to the Ionian Islands, where the men used to have commercial interests before, and some chieftains, for example, Kolkotronis, had lived there not long ago. As the war progressed, the number of refugee women and children in the Ionian island increased. But they were not just from the Morea, but also from the west of Greece and Pyrus. By mid May 1821, 7,000 women and children had moved just to Jander. The refugee numbers increased for as long as the bridge allowed it, which was not always the case. Eventually, the small Ionian islands of Calamus became officially a place where civilian refugees, women and children, and some elderly people were allowed to stay. At some point, their numbers there reached 15,000. Many more refugees resided in the main Ionian islands and were supported by the local inhabitants. Thrace, Macedonia, and Thessaly joined the revolution in May 1821. They were in greater disadvantage than southern Greece because of the greater number of Turks and their army there. They went through very hard times and suffered substantial losses of their population due to the warfare, combined with large-scale massacres, enslavement, and the general flight of the Greeks to safer regions. Arranging for women and children to move, to move before the war reached their, house, their homes was not at all easy. Several Greek sources vividly describe what usually happened in most places. When the Turks or later the Egyptian forces approached the villages, panic-stricken women and children fled in a disorderly fashion and in an often futile attempt to search for shelter up on the mountains, in caves, and on precipitous heights. In the Morea, there were one or two places where very tall removable ladders had been made, which women used in order to climb up to very dangerous heights and hide in unapproachable caves. Often, rather than being captured, young girls and women holding their children committed suicide by throwing themselves off cliffs. Off cliffs. Sometimes they managed to drag the enemy soldiers, holding them down with them. If they were pursued somewhere near the sea, a lake or a river, they cho chose to jump in and drown. When they were on higher ground at the top of precipitous slopes, they dropped rocks and stones and whatever else was available on their pursuers, often managing to kill them. In towns and cities, however, there were foreign consulates where women and children turned to for shelter. In several cases, the foreign consuls helped and protected them. In some others, they, chose their, they closed their doors to them. Foreign eyewitnesses described the country, the courtyards of many European embassies in Constantinople as being so full of Greek people that their residents could hardly enter the mansions without stepping on them. The French consuls in Smyrna and in Patras rescued many Greek families. In contrast, the Turcophile British consul in Patras as well sent the terrified women and children seeking shelter in his consulate away. Large and small scale massacres generally followed this pattern. Men, older women and babies were killed on the spot and younger women girls and young boys were taken prisoners. In most cases, we don't know the exact numbers, either of the dead or of the prisoners. The prisoners were sent 
to sold to be sold in slave markets all over the Ottoman Empire and in Northern Africa. Women generally believed that to become a slave was a worse fate than death, and that's why they preferred to take their own lives and the lives of their children that, rather than being taken prisoners. Moreover, a quick death was always preferable to death by torture, which happened in some cases when women prisoners refused to convert to Islam. That was the fate of the wives of some leaders of the revolution in Nausa in 1822. When they refused to convert, they were tortured to death in Thessaloniki. Having to choose between slavery, conversion or death, 13 young girls of Nausa chose death and threw themselves down the falls of a river. Women and children were driven from various places of Macedonia to Thessaloniki in a series of caravans to be sold in the slave market there. This scene is described by the French consul of that city who, we, who witnessed it on May the 10th, 1822. Desperate women and children of Macedonia first passed into the forbidden grounds of Mount Athos, the holy mountain, seeking shelter there. That was the first time ever that women entered the Agionoros in its thousand year history of, a, of exclusively male monastic communities. The most tragic of all massacres was perhaps that of Hughes, which shocked alike the Greeks and the people of Europe and America. Hughes was the most prosperous island of Greece with a population between 100,000 and 120,000 people. It had thriving commerce with branches in Constantinople, Leghorn, Trieste, and even London. It also had a famous school with an extensive library and a printing press. Between March and July 1822, this island was completely destroyed. In the end, only 1,800 people remained alive there. Of course, some people managed to flee and many other merchants in particular were absent at the time. According to various estimates, approximately 20,000 people were saved. Those slaughtered were said to have been between 30,000 and 42,000. Those who were taken as slaves were estimated to be between 47 and 61,000, nearly all of them women and children. According to the British Consul General at Smyrna, Francis Wary, 45,000 women and children were taken alive and then sold as slaves. Some of them were later ransomed by their rich relatives. We have several chilling eyewitness accounts of the massacres, rapes, torture, and the fate of those taken prisoners. Sorry, I don't know why. Here we are, yeah. Among those prisoners who escaped were a few young boys who after several adventures were helped by American missionaries and volunteers to go to the United States. One of them, the one you see on the picture there, Chris Christophus Plato Cassanis, who eventually became a scholar, published his account uh, of the tragic events in 1851 in the States. There are also several other published accounts by Greeks who survived that ordeal. Reverend Robert Walsh, the chaplain of the British Embassy at Constantinople at that time, gives us some of the most detailed descriptions of the fate of those slaves there. I will read to you a short passage of his account of just one of the several slave markets. It is as good as any picture. The first exposure, he writes, was a number of poor girls of the age of 12 or 14 who were sold like cattle at the English fair. Several of them were without trousers or the necessary articles of dress. Terror and anxiety had so affected them that they exhibited the most deplorable picture of human suffering I ever beheld, and such as cannot be described. 
they were taken and huddled with the roughness of butchers examining young cattle and generally sold at the rate of 100 piastres or three pounds per head. 500 were disposed of here of this in this way from here. Waltz obviously thought that, this, that some of his English readers believed that the Greek women were easily reconciled to being a harem, and so he adds, I quote, the horror and repugnance felt by the freeborn Greek women to sell slavery among the Turks under any modification is invincible, and they infinitely prefer death. Walsh noticed early on something which is also mentioned by various others later, that is that enslaved young girls and women were so ashamed after being so degraded that they felt, and I quote, that they were not worth redeeming, since they could only bring dis disgrace to their families too. So they refused to be ransomed. The Greek boys had an equally terrible fate. Many were compelled to convert. Every day, circumcision would be performed to about 50 boys at the same time in Constantinople, and the boys' mourning could be heard afterwards by passers-by of their houses, of these houses where groups of them were left to recover. If any of the boys later, later reverted to Christianity, they would be immediately put to death. Other misfortunes fell upon those who refused to conversion to, it, conversion to Islam. Some were sent to serve in famous public places akin to brothers, and others were publicly exposed in coffee houses and in hands. One of the watch, of Walsh's friends told him that in one such Han, a boy had asked him to kill him to save him from his misery. Similar things happen to women and children in all slave markets. We have even more horrible accounts by women who were eventually ransomed or managed to escape. For example, a girl described that she was sold 40 times within the same day. Another killed herself to avoid marrying the Turk who had brought, bought her, but her sister, whose hand had been cut off then, was ransomed. All this became widely known to the peoples of Europe and the United States through books and newspapers and helped boost the philhellenic movement. Less well known, but with the same tragic results was another massacre that took place in June 1821. The town of Kidonias, the present day Ivali, was completely destroyed. Kidonias was a flourishing town on the coast of Asia Minor just across from Lesbos. It was a self-governed, completely Greek town with a very important Greek school and a population of about 30,000 people. This town was burnt to the ground. A considerable number of it, the population and Greeks of the nearby villages were saved by the Greek Navy. However, many others were killed or drowned and the rest, women and children, were taken as slaves. Francis Ware again wrote for Smitna that in a town 35 miles away, there was a slave market where thousands of Greek women from Kidonias were sold. Others were also being sold at various cities of Asia Minor. In 1824, two major disasters took place, both on the Aegean Islands. At the end of May of uh, that year, 45 Egyptian ships arrived at the island of Cassus and the Dodecanese. The, the subsequent pillage, massacre, and enslavement of women left the island desolate. Egyptian sh ships took 2,000 women to Alexandria where they were sold. Less than a month later, another major catastrophe took place and left the island of Psara in the North Aegean also completely desolate. Although small, Sarab was the third strongest naval power in Greece. This new total destruction moved the people of Europe and America as much as the destruction of Hughes did. About half of the 7,000 population of Sarah, 
Um, so I escaped, uh, escaped in their ships, but most of the women of the island were captured, although some of them were ransomed later. Even the consul of Russia was killed along with women and children who, who he tried to protect. Several women in the, with their children jumped into the sea to avoid capture and drowned. Others died when the defenders of the fortress detonated the ammunition depot as soon as the Turks got there. Some other women who had tried to escape in rowing boats were killed. What happened to Missolonghi truly shook not only the Greeks, but all the Christian world at the time. The town had become quite well known because of Lord Byron's death there and the numerous references to it in books and newspapers. The long third siege of Missolonghi lasted, with small intervals, for about a year between 1825 and 26. The life of the besieged population during that time was as tragic as the outcome of their exodus was. A rather small number of women and children had initially been sent to the Ionian Islands, not just for safety, but also in order to save on the limited food supplies during the siege. The majority of women, however, remained in the town and they actively helped in the construction of new bastions and the repairing of the walls that were damaged on a daily basis by shell fire of the enemies. When the Greek, the Greek Navy failed to relieve the long siege, the population inside the town had reached the point of starvation. The fighters decided to attempt an organized exit, whatever the cost might be, rather than surrender. Initially, it was suggested that they should kill all the women and children because the sortie would be more dangerous with them and it was probably impossible for them to survive anyway. However, it was not un unusual for men to kill their wives and children rather than to let them fall into the, the hands of the enemy as women also used to do. But the local bishop strongly, very strongly refuted and rejected all, all these ideas. So it was decided finally that the sick the wounded and the elderly, and anyone who didn't wish to, would remain in the town and try to delay the enemy. The women and their children would follow the fighters, who would exit in three separate columns. Many women were dressed in men's clothing since they preferred to be taken for men during the battle and be killed rather than be taken alive. For this reason, cross-dressing was not very uncommon for women, if they were in a camp with the troops or they were traveling alone. However, the sortie, the exodus as it, became, as it became known on the night of the 22nd of April, 1826 was a disaster because the plan had become known to the enemy. Most, that's the gate of the exodus that survives. Most of the Sologi garrison was killed and from the women, just 13 survived, whereas others turned back to the town to save themselves. When the Egyptians entered Missolonghi, the bishop and many of the remaining Greeks blew themselves up with the stored gunpowder. The rest were killed and the women were taken as slaves. The exact number of women killed and or enslaved is once again not known. Foreign sources estimated that those who were taken as slaves were between five and six thousands. The fate of the captives had been described by various uh, foreign authors. Another, a number of them actually saw some of these women in the slave market of Methoni. A town of southeastern Morea and in Ibrahim Pasha's camp. The women were first examined by doctors to, to establish whether they were virgins or not, and whether they had any disease. Then Ibrahim chose the prettiest, kept the ones he liked himself, and the rest were given as gifts to his officials. Afterwards, many women and children were sold 
in slave markets in Egypt and in North African countries. A young virgin could fetch 1,500 piastres at the time. Slaves could be ransomed, but it was a long and complicated process. In the first place, if they had been sold in a slave market, it was difficult to locate where they were and to whom they had been sold. In the case of several successive sales, the task was even more difficult. It was a little easier when they were held by an official or someone who had, in, who had intended to secure ransoms or to make an exchange with prisoners held by the Greeks. However, the ransoms demanded were usually much higher than the selling price in the slave markets, so it was nearly impossible for the majority of the families to ransom their, their relatives. Rich merchants from Hills were able to do that. We know the financial details of the ransoms paid by Theodore Riley's for his wife and two young daughters. He, he paid altogether 13,900 piastres. That was a fortune. The Greek government did not have the means to help much. In July 1824, the men of Tsara petitioned the Greek parliament for money to ransom their women, folk, and children. Their petition was accepted, but only 10,000 piastres were provided to be shared between them. When the ransom asked for just the wife, a child of one of the captains was exactly that sum. A native, a native of Psara, Ioannis Varvakis, a very rich, rich Greek emigrant in Russia, helped in ransoming many women of that island. Sometimes, even when the money was available, it took a very long time for the slaves to be freed by their masters or by those supposedly friendly Turks to whom women and children had been entrusted to protect them. That was the case of the family of a very, very well-known fighter, Kasumulis. The so-called protector of members of his family in Thessaloniki demanded 25,000 piastres to let them go. Seven years later, his mother was released. His two sisters were set free sometimes in 1831. Greeks from various places kept on trying to find and ransom their lost relatives until 1837, as we know from their applications to the Greek government listing the names of their missing relatives. After the fall of Massalonghi, the Philelin Swiss banker Jean Gabriel Einar and the Greek committee of Zander ransomed several of the women of the town. These poor women, like so many others in similar situations, had nowhere to go. They had lost their families and means of subsistence. A number of them remained at first at the refugee camp of Calamus. Others were settled at Napoli on the capital of Greece. But it was a small town lacking both accommodation and the proper hygienic conditions to accommodate the great number of refugee population from all over Greece. Many families lived in extremely bad conditions, sometimes in nearby caves or in self-made huts like the one you can discern here. And lack of food was perhaps the most serious of their problem. It is known that some women and children died from starvation. Clothing was a scarcity as well. Many of these destitute women, however, submitted applications to the authorities describing their desperate situation or the services rendered either by their dead relatives or themselves in the war and asked for a small pension. The government usually did give them one, but it lacked the means to offer a substantial help. Private American aid in 1827 greatly helped to feed and clothe the starving and half-naked Greek population of the Morea and of nearby islands, which were full of refugees. It should be made clear that the insufficient food was quite common for all Greeks during that great, due to that great reduction of agricultural production. The war often prevented any proper cultivation of the land and all the collection of the harvests which were often taken by the enemy itself. From the early years of the revolution, 
The islands of Salamina and Dagina were where Athenian women mainly sought shelter, and so did women from nearby regions. During the two sieges of the Acropolis of Athens, first in 1822 and then in 1826-27, most Athenian women and children were transported to these islands for safety. Their move left the men fighting without having to concern themselves about, them, about them and saved on the food supplies of the besieged. Of the besieged. George Waddington, the Dean of Durham, a traveler at the time, attempted a kind of census with the help of the Greek clergy and the Austrian consul of Athens in 1824. Of the 11,500 people living in Salamina that year, the locals were just 192. Although by then, most Athenians were already back in Athens, where more refugees had gathered from elsewhere. During the lengthy second siege of the Acropolis, and as the war continued in Attica, the Athenian women and children, once more refugees in Salamina, were living in such bad conditions that the acting bishop of Athens, of Athens asked the inhabitants of Aegina to come to help them. The news became widely known and fundraising began for the support that started among other Greeks as well. Soon over 3,000 piastres were collected. Women and children also suffered during the second phase of the civil war in the Morea, when troops from Rumeli moved in to help their friendly faction against their opponents. Then the shortage of food became even worse as irregular soldiers planted the rich regions of the Morea. Some sources mentioned that there were attacks on the women as well as rapes, while others claim that rapes were actually rare because of the widespread superstition among the men that those who committed such a crime would be killed in battle. Rapes were extremely rare before the revolution and they were severely punished those who raped women, particularly if the girl was a virgin. It was not always easy, however, to punish these crimes properly during the war. But at the very least, the man was obliged to marry his victim without any dowry, or, or alternatively, alternatively, he would have to pay a very heavy fine as a compensation. Aside from their everyday chores, women also helped in the warfare. We know that they acted as couriers, messengers, and even spies. They carried food and ammunition for the soldiers to their camps. In some cases, in Athens, for example, they helped prepare the ammunition the men used. We have already mentioned how they all helped with the reinforcement, reinforcements of the wars during the siege of Thessaloniki. They also fought. They did that to protect themselves during their flights on the mountains, as we have seen. But they also participated in battles, although they did not usually bear arms. There were, of course, exceptions, and certainly some women, like Bebulina, had their own weapons. But commonly, women went into battle carrying all kinds of domestic or farm tools, such, for example, or clubs, iron roads, and in their absence, stones and rocks. At the beginning of the revolution, there were not enough weapons even for the men. So those who without also had to fight with agriculture tools until they killed the Turk to get his weapons. That's how the women of Mani fought at the siege of Tripolitza in 1821 and in 1826, when without or with very few arms, when they bravely pushed back the Egyptians of Ibrahim Pasha who had invaded Mani, and they successfully faced down sieges in their towers. Some women, were also carried out arms during the exodus from Salongi, but that was a special occasion. Only two women in Greece and abroad at the time were very famous, Lascarina Bubulina and Mandoma Frogeni. They were depicted on stamps and on Greek coins and banknotes. That was, of course, before the Europe. On 30th March, 
2018, a presidential decree posthumously conferred the honorary rank of Rear Admiral, the Medal of Exceptional Arts, and the First Class War Cross to Bubulina. It is commonly said that both Bubulina and Mando were members of the Filigeteria, the secret society of friends. However, their names are not included in any of the surviving lists of the society members. Only, once, one, only one woman's name appears in those lists, that of one Kriyaki Nafti. She was the wife of a medical doctor practicing, practicing in Zbirna, and he was a member of the Filigeteria. When Kiraki found some of its secret documents that he kept at home, it was agreed by other members of the Eteria to put her under oath and initiate her. Once this was done, Kiriaki paid the very high sum of 3,000 piastres as a contribution to the cause, since donations were obligatory for the new members. Bubulina and Mando had very few things in common other than their patriotism and their distinguished and prosperous family background. There are several references to both of them from contemporary Greeks and foreigners alike. Their portraits were published frequently in various publications, but these illustrations were mostly imaginary. Bubulina was from Hydra and has been described correctly as rather homely and stout. She was middle-aged and a widow after two marriages with wealthy ship owners from Spetses. She had six grown-up children, three from each of the two marriages, but three of her sons were killed at the war. Uh, Bubulina was called after her second husband's surname, Bubulis, and that's her signature. She was intelligent and capable, and after being widowed, she proved to be a very good manager of the family fortune, which she considerably increased. In 1820, she had built a very expensive, very large 18 cannon ship named Agamemnon, which she used as her flagship, while she also had three smaller ships. Bubulina was at the, at the siege of Tripolitsa and participated in several naval operations, for example, the blockade of Napoleon and of Monimacia. Within a few years, she had spent all her fortune on her, on her fleet. She supported Kolokotronis during the Civil War, so she was persecuted as she was. In 1825, she was killed in Spetses during another a dispute with a local family. The Greeks admired this manly, as they called woman, and she was even described as an unusual natural phenomenon. She was very popular in Europe and thus had numerous imaginary portraits you show. Manto, so for Madeleine Mavrogeni, daughter of a rich merchant of Mykonos, was young, pretty, and well-educated. She spoke Italian and French, and she was dressed in a European fashion. Also, she was single. Curiously enough, we don't have many details about her contribution to the war. There is a certificate written by Dimitris Psilandis stating that during the first two years of the revolution, she had funded the corps of 200 men to fight in the Morea. She had also funded two expeditions, one for a band of men to go to help Samos and another to go to Hills for the same purpose. But both were made under the cover of male relatives' names because she didn't want to upset her family. In October 1822, leading a band of men, she helped to repel an attack on Mykonos by Algerian pirates. Her participation in an expedition to Caristos is uncertain, but she contributed 2,000 piastres towards its coast. Mando wrote two letters, one to the ladies of England and the other to the ladies of France to move their sympathies for the Greek cause. 
The letter to the French ladies was published at the end of the book written about her by Genevieve in 1825. She had a very unhappy love story with Dimitris Ypsilantis who broke off their engagement. Then, feeling wronged and perhaps dishonored, she started a futile legal battle against him for breach of promise. She spent all her dowry and she even borrowed money to find the war, to fund the war. She ended up poor and alone, surviving on a small pension. There were other women who also fought on the war, but they did not become famous outside Greece. Domna Bisvizis, the wife of the Thracian captain Antonis Bisvizis, was on board his ship along with their five children when he was killed during a naval operation in 1822. Immediately after, she took over the command of the ship and the crew of 75 men and continued fighting. She kept on fighting for two more years until she ran out of means to support the operation of the ship, which she donated to Hitler's Navy. Afterwards, she lived with her children in poverty, petitioning for a small pension uh, to the government. One of her sons, the 11-year-old Themistocles, was sent to study in France by the French Philhellenic Committee, along with a small number of, of other boys from mar uh, maritime families. An even less well-known woman who distinguished herself in battles was Tavriana Savena, a 40-year-old widow and mother of five children from Mani. She fought bravely with Kyriakoulis Mavromichalcis' corps in Morea and in Rumeli. She took part in the siege of Tripolitsa and in the battles of Altece, Trikorfa, and Verga. In 1829, she petitioned the Argos National Assembly for a small pension for her participation in the war, which it was confirmed by attached signed uh, certificates of several chieftains. She was given a small pension and lived in great poverty all her long life afterwards. Foreign sources at refer at length to a young female fighter and leader of a small band of men in the early years of the revolution. She was Constantina, daughter of Zachargas Barbichotis, the famous cleft of the Morea, who was killed in 1806 by the Turks. It is curious also that she is not mentioned by her contemporary Greeks. In any case, Edward Blackwell, um, agent of the Philhellenic Greek community of London, met her and wrote her story, adding that all her claims were verified by the local notable Sicinis. Costadina had been wounded twice, first in the winter of 1822 and later in the Battle of Patras. When Blackwell met her, she was recover recovering at Gastuni, a small town in northwestern western Morea. Bukoville, the well-known traveler and writer, also narrates Costadina's life, but in a romantic and rather fictional way. There were certainly many more anonymous women whose everyday fight for survival and freedom has not been recorded. A brief addition is necessary to acknowledge the contribution of a learned young lady, Evanthea Kairis, who used her writing as a weapon in the war. She was the sister of the scholar Theophilus Kairis, a teacher at the school of Kidanese. Since a very young age, Evanthea corresponded with Corais in Paris, and at his suggestion, she translated two works on the education of the girls, one of which she was pub it was published later. Evanthea's letter to the Philhellene ladies abroad was printed anonymously in Hydra in 1825, and it was undersigned by 39 other Greek women. This letter was translated into English and into French in 1826. During the revolution, people's private lives continued as before to the degree that the exceptional circumstances allowed it. So marriages never stopped, even under very difficult circumstances. According to the traditional custom, arranged marriages were still the norm and a dowry still necessary. Colocotron is just a uh, commonly known as Photakos, claimed that despite all the hardships and dangers, 
Greeks kept marrying because they wanted to increase their numbers. At the time, marriages also became a very useful instrument in order to secure alliances or establish rec reconciliation between the families of the chieftains and all politicians. As a result, many arranged marriages took place for political purposes. I will mention just a few as an example. Kolokotronis arranged the marriage of his eldest son, Panos, to Bubulinas' daughter, Eleni, thus linking his family with one of the most important families of the islands. When Panos was killed in the civil war, Bubulina married her widowed daughter to Theodorax Grivas, a Rumeliot general, establishing a bond, a bond with the Rumeliot faction. Kolokotronis also arranged the marriage of his second son, Ioannis, nicknamed Yeneos for his bravery, to Fotini Javela, sister of the Suliot general Kitsos Javelas. Mavrokordatos brought his sister Ekaterini from Constantinople to give her in marriage to the politician and supporter of the English party, Spiriton Trikoupis. Traditionally, the notable families would intermarry, so would those of the chieftains. But a change to this general custom was introduced during the revolution. Marriages between chieftains, children, and those of notables became common for political purposes. There were also marriages and engagements between Greek girls and foreign men, European philanines, volunteers, and travelers. What was completely a new phenomenon was the marriages between Greek men and converted Muslim women. We don't know the actual extent of this phenomenon, but there have been at least three such cases of distinguished persons of the revolution who married Muslim girls who had been baptized. Divorces were not generally uncommon. Although during the revolution, the new laws introduced early on acquired a more secular character, the church still continued to have not only the responsibility for the spiritual dissolution of the marriage, but in practice also the implementation of all family law, divorces included. These were decided based on Byzantine laws, which remained state laws for about a decade. Women filed for divorces, and you see one here, mostly on the grounds of abandonment, mistreatment and abuse, drunkenness and for unsocial habits and behavior. Illegal marriages were easily dissolved by the church as they had been previously. The surviving official documents show that it was common for women to claim their rights in matters of dowry, inheritance, misappropriation of their money or property, etc. In war years, the very strict social mores gradually began relaxing and unacceptable, unacceptable behaviors made an appearance. Adultery, however, which was not uncommon in the past, does not figure very highly in the divorce cases. What became rather common was that several chieftains lived openly with their lovers and occasionally took them along on their expeditions. When such behavior, however, became too ostentatious and provocative, like that of the politician Ioannis Koletis, it caused social dis disapproval, which was expressed in several of the member memoirs of, the of his contemporaries. Concubinous, previously unknown among the Greeks of the Ottoman Empire, made its appearance in mainland Greece as well. Even a form of prostitution, more or less organized, something unheard of before in Greece, is described as taking place in Patras near the end of the revolution. Among all these changes, there was only one positive de development. That was in 1824, when a school for girls was established on the Acropolis of Athens with the financial contribution and support of four monasteries, along with a separate school for boys. 56 Athenian girls were initially enrolled in this school, which was named appropriately in Parthenon. This school didn't last long because of the second siege of the Acropolis of the Turks in 1826. In the island of, on the island of Syros too, there was a school for both boys and girls before 1829. 
It was directed by a German doctor, Christian Ludwig Korg, a member of the American Missionary Society. We have seen how much Greek women and their families suffered. After nearly 10 years of war, only a small part of Greece was officially recognized as an independent state. It took more than a century to, re to reach its present borders. The Greek women's lives gradually changed for the better, but this is also another story to be told at another time. Before closing, can we really say who the victims were and who their fighters? As I see it, amidst all the misery and pain, the losses, the tragedies and everyday hardship, all women proved to be real fighters. Anonymous and eponymous, they all suffered one way or another and they fought their own war, trying to survive with dignity along with their children. They fought for their religion, for their honor and their country with whatever means they had and for as long as they could. Thank you. Thank you, Eleni, for an incredibly informative and incredibly rich uh, lecture. I'm sure you will be happy to take some questions from the audience. I would like to remind everyone that if you want to ask a question, you may do so either by using the raise hand icon, which is under the reactions uh, button at the bottom of your screen, or you can simply type your question in the chat and I will pose it to, to our speaker. Uh, while we are waiting for a few questions to arrive, Eleni, can I ask you, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that there were some limits imposed on the number of refugees that they could go to they could I can't. I can't hear you very well, Simos. Can you repeat? Yes, of course. At the beginning of your talk, you you mentioned that there were some limits imposed by the British on how many refugees could go to the Ionian Islands. Oh yes. And, and there were fluctuating limits. So what uh, what determined? There was not exactly a, a number in those limits, but they were, you know, they were disapproving of you know, large refugees populations gathering into the islands because they were afraid of, there was a Russophobia at the time, and they were afraid that uh, the, the revolution was incited by and helped by the Russians. And they were afraid that uh, the, Ionian lo the local population would join the revolution. And they were afraid of all those things. And of course they didn't want to to, to get to very bad terms with the Turks at the time. Um, so they tried to keep a neutrality. <clears throat> uh, a neutrality, it was very hard and uh, a lot of uh, restrictions and severe punishments were, you know, practiced. Uh, so much so that uh, even some um, people brought that to the parliament to be discussed in Britain, the British Parliament, that it was unacceptable to, to do this and that uh, in Corfu and Zante in particular in other islands. So um, they, it was easier to help after uh, Kanek um, accepted uh, the, um, it was uh, first foreign minister and then um, as a P, uh, MP, uh, PM, and uh, he accepted that uh, the Greeks uh, were not rebels, but uh, belligerents. Thank you. Uh, so at the time, things relaxed a little, and so they received poor refugees at Calamus Island. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe the uh, Nectaria Klapaki has raised. Yes. Nectaria, if you are unmute yourself, we can hear you. Yes, thank you, Simos. Um, thank you to the organizers and thank you, Eleni, for this wonderful talk. Uh, it was really fascinating and uh, I look forward to reading your book when it comes out. Um, so, my question uh, is you mentioned that um, the Greek women had more legal rights than um, their European, other European women at the time. 
Uh, could you please give us some examples of the uh, legal rights that the Greek women enjoyed at the time and that were absent in uh, uh, Western uh, states? Well, there were different legal states in different countries, but in general, Greek women uh, had full uh, ownership of their uh, dowry. Uh, their husbands might use it for business purposes, but they couldn't uh, misappropriate it or sold it or, you know, that's why if a bad use of their uh, dowry was made, they could go, uh, the women uh, went to the church because the church uh, judged those, all those uh, family matters and asked for their diaries to be returned or they could, uh, uh, they could um, file for a divorce. They could uh, go to the church to uh, ask for whatever rights they believed they had, if they had been mistreated, if they had been expelled from their household, if um, they were, uh, they could ask for a divorce for various reasons, even more re uh, than they were legally accepted by the Byzantine laws, who were very strict to divorcing people. Um, they could manage their property even as uh, they, uh, if they inherited, for example, a married woman uh, received her inheritance from her parents or from other sources, she could manage it by herself. Uh, this uh, could not be touched by her husband. She had full legal right. That's why some women had private enterprises because they could manage their own money or they could manage their own inheritance. Um, so I, I don't know about German. I, I've read about people discussing uh, uh, about how, how limited legal rights uh, women had even after the French Revolution. That's, they were not considered citizens anyway. Even after the French Revolution, they were not considered proper citizens. And when the, the, uh, it was published, the rights of the citizens, uh, you know, all that, uh, women were not included in that document. So um, the, they had the, the, the rights that, uh, particularly the, the women who were married and the widows, they could do as they wished. Thank you, Eleni. The next question is by Stephen Joyce, who is uh, asking about the yes. topic that you mentioned uh, a good friend. Throughout in your talk, he's asking to what extent has the Greek experience of this time as refugees shaped the current attitude Greece has towards. I can't hear you. I don't know. I can't hear you. Sorry. I will repeat louder. So, to what extent has the Greek experience at this time as refugees shaped the current attitude Greece has towards the Syrian refugee situation? Not only Syrian refugees, but all kinds of, from all places were accepted very, you know, with very friendly intentions here, the first years when this thing started. We never forget that in lots of various periods, quite a lot of Greeks or their ancestors or their families had been the refugees themselves. So refugees were welcomed. But when millions entered Greece, and these were not just refugees, because they were just uh, passing by somehow, uh, people who wanted to go to Germany and other places who did not accept them to work. They were migrants. They were not refugees. That was the problem. That was the great difficulty we had to distinguish between real refugees and people who are not refugees. 
even you know terrorists tried to, to pass through Greece. The one who had attacked, uh, I don't, had made a very serious attack in Belgium, had passed through Greeks, through Greece at the time with false papers. Others had not papers at all because the, the refugees tried to have papers. The other ones, those who from Afghanistan who wanted to go to wherever, what they did either didn't take the papers along or they threw them into the sea. So all the people who still are coming into Greece had no papers to prove from where they are or what their purpose is. So at some point, and that's what happened with the small uh, Aegean islands with the Greek refugees, people could not support all this big bulk of people come entering into Greece. There was not, there were not means to support. It was very hard for Lesbos and still is. It was very hard for Hills and still is. And uh, those people, at least most of them, did not want to come here to stay. They wanted to pass through Greece to other countries, even the refugees. Refugees are given asylum when it is made clear that they are actually refugees and still are. Now, what was the problem before? It was a very long and difficult procedure to make sure who were real refugees and who were they were not. And then those who were not, were supposed to be in agreement with the Turkey and the EU that those who are not refugees and they are coming through uh, from Turkey to here, they should be returned back and Turkey doesn't take them back. So people are stuffed here and in most cases in uh, villages and in, uh, you know, some islands, they are more than the local people. And this is dangerous because you, if you don't know who they are, actually are. So we're trying to cope. We have a, a many more questions on the historical content of the talk. One by Olympia Kutsokalis asks, in what ways do the exceptional female figures of Greece, Bubulina and Manto, differ from the women of the French Revolution or other revolutions in Europe at the time? Well, they had, the, the women in Greece at the time were not fighting uh, to overthrow uh, their local notables. Perhaps they don't, didn't like them, but that the, the revolution was against uh, those who kept them as slaves. There were regions who were, had some semi-autonomous, which lived under better conditions. But in most cases, people considered themselves slaves. Um, uh, and it, it was very, even when they had some insurances about certain rights, this was not always the case because it was up to the masters to change the rules or just disregard them. So it was not something that was, uh, the participation of women was natural because it was for national reasons, it was for religious reasons and because they had been in, more, in many places they had been subjected to such a difficult lives and so many difficult problems they just wanted to self-govern themselves it was not you know there's a long history discussing whether the, the, the reasons of the university uh, of the revolution was social or economical. It has been going on for ages, this thing. But I don't, I think the people's main mo motive was national. Thank you, Lenny. 
Uh, there is a question by Vanessa Felix, who is asking, uh, with people writing letters to other countries, such as the ladies who wrote to France and England, did other countries eventually step in to assist Greece in their war for independence? Well, not, not the countries officially, but there were, there were very strong uh, philhellenic movements uh, in most places in Europe, in, uh, in uh, Austria, whose uh, government was very inimical to uh, matter, it was very inimical to all sorts of things like uh, 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 upheavals and revolutions and uh, all upsets because everything reminded him uh, the French Revolution. Most Greeks were not against uh, having a kingdom, uh, having been a kingdom as such. Um, politically, we're not so, uh, at least the mass of people were not revolutionary in the respect quite a lot of uh, European governments thought them to be. They were, this was a mis misunderstanding of their purposes. They just wanted to be free and they wanted to be, to exercise their religion freely and to have their own laws and to have some sort of uh, self-government. Uh, there are, of course, they wanted to have a better life and they could not uh, expect to have a better life when they were under a foreign rule at the time. The foreign governments, however, had, you know, uh, they didn't want to upset the Ottoman government at all because they had uh, very important privileges in the Ottoman Empire, which were not recent. They were going back to the 16th century. They had commercial interests uh, because through Turkey, they traveled to the rest of Asia. Uh, it was not necessary for them to go by boat because at the time they had to circle, to go circle all, all over the all over Africa and in order to reach uh, the, the Indian Ocean, uh, it took them ages. Uh, so uh, it was, uh, the, the governments disapproved of the revolution. Uh, the people started supporting the revolution and there was such a great philhellenic movement and that's what the letters tried to do. Uh, that's why a lot of volunteers from Germany, for example, or Austria, from all over Europe entered uh, into Greece very early on, the first months of the revolution to help the Greeks. But that was against their government's um, uh, interest and uh, their will. And they always tried to cut down you know, one way or another uh, people to join the revolution and leave their countries to go there. Uh, but eventually when war went on and Brit the British and the French interests, uh, even Austrian interests were harmed by the continuous warfare and uh, they were still afraid that the Russian might interfere. That was the, uh, what they were afraid of mostly. They thought it would be better if uh, try to mediate between uh, the belligerents and the Ottoman government. And that was the, what they tried to do first, to create some sort of mediation uh, but the Greeks worked on a different schedule and the foreign governments worked on their own. Um, the letters moved people and people like the people uh, in the States helped a lot, particularly the, we have very important fighters from the States who came very, on, very early on in Greece but uh, it was a really very great help for uh, the people in uh, when the, the 
although there was this um, moral decision not to interfere, keep the states neutral, uh, there was a very great uh, uh, American European uh, philhellenic, uh, how say, wave. Uh, who collected a lot of money, collected a lot to buy food. They sent food, they sent clothes. Uh, if you find and read, they are not inaccessible. You can find them in, uh, in the internet nowadays. The books are written by those who brought the American aid into Greece. They make a great story. And we have some of the best descriptions of the bad state, the the general population lived at the time by those Americans who had come, missionaries and people especially sent to bring in the, uh, the support. So the letters helped to keep alive the Philhellenic movement. The letters itself did not influence the foreign governments. The people inside England, say, helped by pressing their government. It was not the Greeks that pressed. They didn't care about the Greeks. They preferred neutrality, and they definitely didn't want the Russia to get into the war with the Ottoman Empire. So the, the main purpose was to keep them apart and keep peace in Europe, not a new war, which the, all the countries would be involved. And even the great uh, battle of, um, naval battle of uh, Navarino was not well received by the British government at the time. In fact, they tried to somehow uh, not find, find ways to excuse Codrington, who initiated the, uh, the naval battle, saying that uh, uh, it was impossible not to interfere because he was attacked and things like that. They, they, what they tried to do was create uh, Greece or part of Greece uh, a tribute, uh, how, how to say, a country not fully independent, uh, under the Ottomans, but with uh, local freedom. And the, after that, they had paid an enormous amount, amount of money as a tribute to the Ottomans. That's what they were trying to do at the time. That was their main point. Somehow they were obliged of the events, and particularly when the Russia, an Ottoman Russian. Turkish national war, Turkish Russian war started in 1829. After that, they were afraid that the Russians would take great part of Ottoman Empire, will get down and close that uh, means. So, uh, what they were worrying was uh, about Russians' expansion to the Balkans, actually. Thanks. I don't know, I've made myself clear. It's very complicated. You, you have to know lots of things that get it in the way. I think you, you gave a very full and clear picture, Eleni. There are many comments that are congratulating you on the lecture, stating how excited you are. Really so you are very kind. It's very difficult to find, uh, to say simple things uh, to people who don't know a lot of things about those things, which are, are complicated uh, as they are. Even when you talk about everyday life, it's complicated for people to understand why women were married uh, when they were 12 years old, for example. I think you did so admirably and we all uh, learned a lot. So uh, we have a lot of questions, but I'm going to pose two more so that then everybody can uh, get on with their uh, they, oh, yes, absolutely. It, it's already long wear. <laughs> or their night or their evening. So one question by uh, E.K. He's signing with his initials or her initials is, are there any accounts of Turkish women supporting or even freeing uh, Greek women slaves? 
Well, uh, not not uh, local, not locally, but uh, for example, uh, the uh, the wife of the salt and the mother of the sultan in Constantinople, uh, who was uh, interfered to stop the massacre in Hughes, but that was. Uh, uh, something that had harmed her financial affairs very much because uh, all the tribute uh, paid by Hughes went to her coffers. So she had every, every reason to stop the, that. So uh, as far as I know, I know there was not such a thing. And there is a question by Katerina. Uh, Daifoti, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correct, uh, which asks, was slavery a common practice in the Ottoman Empire? And did the enslaved Greek women had any impact on the development of the Greek state and society? What society? Uh, on Greek state and Greek society. Well, uh, slavery was very common and it was common very late on in the Ottoman Empire it, and in most uh, Muslim states at the time. And uh, those who were enslaved were what the word says, slaves. They had no rights at all, no rights, not even to their lives, nothing. Um, the enslaved women, many of them were not freed or they did not survive. There were relatively few, relatively few. There was, I'll add that and I'll stop because uh, <laughs> it took so long. Um, it was obvious that there was a considerable lack of women and children by the end of the revolution because Kapodistrius had asked the Austrian negotiator with uh, Rockets von Austin for Austin, who was the European negotiator uh, between the Greeks and the Egyptians, that in any exchange of prisoners, he preferred to have Greek women and children to be liberated rather than men. That means that there was a demographical problem. It hasn't been taken the, the, the attention that needs this fact, uh, but obviously, in order to to state officially this demand to have women and children liber liberated rather than men, that means that quite a lot of women uh, had died or been slaved, enslaved. So they needed women for the new the new state. And, uh, it was a demographical problem. And, and I see another question, which uh, I think it can be a great final question. This is again by Olivia Kutsokalis, who is asking which female trope, the warrior mother Bubulina or the virgin charitable patroness Manto, was more accepted among Greeks at the time? And how about Philhellenes? Which one did they more accept? Oh, they. The Philhellenes accepted mo uh, both in the same way. Uh, Manto was more appealing because she was more close to the female figures they knew. And uh, uh, the volunteers, the French volunteers made a, a lot of fuss over her and all, all this. Uh, Bubulina was popular for other reasons, because she was what we called androgyneka, uh, a woman fighting like a man. Uh, she was a very strong figure. She was so very different from all other women well known uh, internationally. So she appealed this way. The, the appeal Pando had was a different one. And uh, she was in, uh, how say, in rather close contact with lots of uh, French officers and um, foreigners in Napoleon. 
so uh, they saw a different kind of the usual Greek woman. Bubulina was also a different kind of the usual Greek woman. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been wonderful. So I would like to invite everyone to join me in a virtual round of applause for this wonderful lecture, for this very informative lecture. And I, in my turn, I would like to thank and acknowledge their excellencies, the ambassador of Greece to the USA, Alexandra Papadopoulou, the ambassador of Greece to Canada, Constantina Thanasiadou, the consul general of Greece in Los Angeles, Evgenia Benyatoglu, the Consul General of Greece in, uh, in Vancouver, Eleni Yorgopoulou, and the Honorary Consul of Cyprus in Los Angeles, Andreas Kiprianidis. I would like to thank our colleagues at the Simon Fraser University and uh, all of you for being here with us today. We look forward to seeing you at our future events. My, uh, myself, I thank everybody, and particularly the ambassador who had the patience and the time to attend the whole lecture. Thank you very much, everybody.